Good morning and thank you for joining us here on the Morning Medical Update. I'm Jessica Lovell. It is summer and just like many of you, we are working hard to bring you some fun and exciting shows come fall. This morning we are bringing you a rebroadcast of one of our favorite shows. If you have any questions, please leave them below. We will answer them during our live broadcasts on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. So sit back and enjoy this best of morning medical update. Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dolph Simons Family Studio. Delighted to be back with you on this gra grainy, gray, rainy day. In studio with us today is the director of the Jean and Barbara Burnett Burn Unit here at the health system, Dr. Deval Bavshar. And out at the Olathe Fire Department, Fire Marshal and Assistant Chief of Community Risk Reduction, Mark Wassum is standing by along with uh, perhaps, I'm not sure if we have that or her, the public education specialist, Michelle McLean on as well. Today we are R-rated, or at least PG-13. We're gonna be blowing stuff up again. <laughs> we started using it yesterday and we're gonna use fireworks to blow up fruit and burn hot dogs to illustrate, illustrate the danger of those fireworks. We want to remind you that these folks that are doing this are professionals. So don't try what we show you at home. Don't go blowing up watermelons, et cetera. This is for demonstration only. Okay, but before we get to that, Hawkeye, you're back on the road again. There's a Willie Nelson song on that. Do you remember, do you know that song? Oh no, he's gonna sing. On the road again, I can't wait to get on the road again. Making music, playing soccer with my friends. Oh, I can't wait to get on the road again. Your son's playing soccer, is that right? Yeah. His tournament yeah, went pretty I well? What, yo, what's that? You, his tournament's going pretty well. I understand you're like at some big final or something out in St. Louis. What's going on with that? Yeah, it, it'd be good to get at home. Um, I drove from Denver <laughs> to Kansas City and then Kansas City to St. Louis all yesterday. So I got a good little I-70 stretch there. Yeah, um, he on is the road in again. The Midwest Regional Championships for uh, the 2006 or the U-15 uh, boys with his team. So today's the semifinals. So if they lose, I will be back in studio tomorrow. Okay. And if they win, I will be doing the show from... Uh, the same place I'm doing it right now. So, Awesome. Well, congratulations to your son. I guess that he got vaccinated and he's still playing great soccer. Pretty good stuff. Uh, you know what? That was a, po that was a point I was going to make. You know, he, he's able to do this now uh, because he is vaccinated. So I'm not concerned about pulling him out for any uh, missed participation because of any quarantining or uh, circulating coronavirus. Yeah, we're going to come back to that question in just a minute because lots yeah. of stuff kind of going on around the Delta thing and now the Delta Plus out there in India, too. So how do we, how do, we do overnight? And I, I would just like to say before we get to that, that, um, you know, a lot of his teammates and their older uh, siblings were vaccinated prior to to um, to all of this. So that is another good thing. Most of his it team is, is vaccinated. Yeah, that helps. Um, how are we doing? You know, we at the health system have 13 active patients with five in the ICU, four ventilators and one on ECMO, still eight of uh, the additional uh, recovery period patients. So 21 total. Hayes has one uh, active patient. But I would also like to say our last death at the health system was June 19th. So that is a very good thing. But as you can see, we still have very sick patients requiring ventilatory support and of course, ECMO. Yeah, that, that ECMO thing is going to be tough. Hopefully that will end up going yeah. okay. So a lot of big news. So first, the World Health Organization says, I don't care if you've been vaccinated, keep your masks on. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, again, um, the World Health Organization has to speak to the entire world. Uh, not every country is as fortunate as we are here in the United States. Um, but again, just like the CDC, their main concern is the general public health. So I understand people now will probably use this um, as further division about um, what to do and what is right. And, you know, we, meaning medical or public health professionals, don't really know what's going on. Coronavirus is a complicated issue. We know the devastation that it's caused, the morbidity, the mortality. Uh, all of the countries don't have, aren't as fortunate to have a surplus of vaccine as we are. So there can still be a lot of spread out there. 
um, not so much if you're vaccinated, but for those unvaccinated populations around you in those other countries, in those other geographic regions as well. Yeah, I think that's the key, right? The World Health Organization is not going to try and parse this into small bite-sized chunk, chunks yeah. for every county like we do in the United States. They're just going to say, yeah. look, here's a recommendation for the world, wear a mask. Interestingly, there are some countries that are uh, – go ahead. No, but I was going to say, but it's like you and I have always said, it's about identifying uh, risk benefit. And this is a Swiss cheese model as well, although the vaccines really – block up a lot of those holes from the Swiss cheese and are extremely effective at, at giving protection, there are still those non-pharmaceutical interventions and you can still weigh those risks and benefits of anything that you're doing and still continue to mask if you would like and distance and do things outdoors and all of those things. So, Hawk, um, one way to look at this too is just to see reflecting around the world, Australia, Israel, yeah. other countries are saying, we're going to start going back into lockdown mode again because we're having more infection spreads. I think uh, Israel is going back to masking indoors. Uh, I think Australia is another country that are saying, Malaysia and others are saying, we're going to go back into more of a strict lockdown mode because this Delta virus is causing trouble and we don't have enough folks vaccinated. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, nobody here, nobody wants lockdowns. Um, but we do understand uh, that adding restrictions does help reduce the spread of the disease, as does the masking, as does vaccination. You know, would Springfield, would, would that be a good candidate to have increased or imposed restrictions? It might be understanding the devastation, the capacity issues that are happening right now in that geographic area. Um, just looking on a website today, covariance.org, uh, looking back in late May in Kansas and Missouri, the Delta variant was about 10% of the sequences that they were able to identify. But now if we move to today, uh, it is anywhere from 65 to 75% of the variants that are sequenced in Kansas and Missouri. So we know the Delta variant is quickly becoming that prevalent, uh, prevalent isolate. And we keep saying to people, it's a younger, it gets into younger folks, too. All these kids are going to be getting dealt the variant. And um, yeah. so I think the, the risk is especially to those unvaccinated. There was one um, article today in The New York Times I was looking at that was talking about the rise of the Delta variant. What does it mean for the United States? They were pointing out that some states with very low vaccination rates, like Missouri, um, may have to yeah. be thought of more as a country where they're having to go back into lockdown mode. Now, Missouri resisted that the whole time. But this Delta variant could really wreak yeah. havoc just as it is in Springfield, Missouri. You know, absolutely. And early data from Scotland does show that um, there is an increased risk of hospitalization uh, from the Delta variant. I think it was a uh, uh, 1.85 increased risk or, or, or you know, um, and these are, like you said, affecting younger people. But in the same vein, there are uh, reports, research articles out now showing that AstraZeneca and the mRNA vaccines all provide good protection against Delta variant. So vaccination continues to be the way that you can protect yourself and, you know, and your loved ones. Although, interestingly, they kind of push that you need a two-shot regimen, not a one-shot regimen for yeah. this, and meaning that the J&J &J vaccine may work, but they, they were saying that after the first dose of the mRNA, you only get some pretty, you really need that second dose to be really effective against yeah. the Delta variant. So that's just another yeah. thing we have to think about uh, and, and, yeah. and how that will affect us going forward. All yeah. right. So um, let's see if there's any reporter questions online. Good morning, guys. Taylor, Channel 41. How are you this morning? Hey, Taylor. How are you? Taylor. Good. Thank you. I want to touch on that topic, Dr. Stites, you were just talking about with J&J &J and, the, and the Delta variant. Um, I was looking at an article right now from CNN from yesterday where they quoted uh, their medical analyst, Dr. Do Dr. Jonathan Reiner, and he said, uh, we have two very effective vaccines against the Delta variant, and if the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is significantly less effective, then we should stop giving it. Um, I, I just want to ask your response to that and, and really if you could talk more about how Johnson Johnson stacks up against Delta right now, especially when we don't know as much as we do about the other vaccines potentially. Yeah, Hawk, I would say we don't know a lot about the difference in terms of the, just the J&J &J vaccine. I'm really anxious to see what happens with the, the, the their two-shot data should be coming out in July. Um, but, I, you know, 
in my personal opinion, I like the mRNA vaccines a whole lot because I like the two-shot stuff. I like the efficacy data. I like the long-lasting immunity that it, the, the, the two-shot regimen appears to give us. So I'm a little biased that way uh, over a one-shot regimen. We need more information, though, about the J&J &J and the, the, the Delta variant and now this Delta Plus variant that's coming out of India. What yeah. do you think? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, we know the, the vaccines. We really equate the... Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines to each other. Uh, we have been somewhat equating the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines with each other because they are both those non-replicating viral vectors that, that have that spike that we make that antibody and that immune response to. Uh, interestingly, also in that Scottish paper uh, about hospitalizations and, and risk about the Delta variant, they also do provide, however, that both the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines do provide very good protection against hospitalization uh, for the Delta variant as well. So just as you said, we're learning more and more about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, but hopefully that is an indication that Johnson & Johnson is also providing better protection. The guidance uh, is not to, uh, to mix dosing or get uh, mRNA vaccines after you had Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But overall, if that were to happen, you know, I certainly believe it would be safe. I don't think you would have really any any ill or adverse events from mixing those doses and getting that. But right now, there's no guidance to to get a separate vaccine uh, dosing if you've already received Johnson and then Johnson. Yeah, not yet. I'll be, I'll that be was very be a curious. Question for me. Please. I was going to ask because we, you know, as you know, we had the the large. Uh, Arrowhead vaccination event earlier this year that was a Johnson & Johnson vaccination event. I mean, of the thousands of people who were vaccinated that way during that event, should they be considering doing something else with the uh, Delta variant news right now? I think they ought to be making sure that they follow the re the recommendations closely because I think we're all watching this for th this very question. You know, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, I think, in the in the Scottish and the British evidence, still suggested you needed two shots, not one shot. Was that right? Is that right, Hawk? Because I know that's what that's uh, recommended yeah. from other data for yeah. the Delta variant. You needed both shots to really get protection. The question I have in J&J &J yeah. is the efficacy after one shot is not what it is after Pfizer or Moderna. One shot, actually, nor two shots. And so even though it's still extraordinarily high, remember back at the beginning of the crisis, we would have taken a 50 or 60 or 60 percent. I said, that's great news. And, and, and you know, J&J uh, &J ended up around 68 or 70. So it still had good data. But. Man, this Delta variant would spook me a little bit. I don't think I could recommend to a patient. I have a couple of my patients I'm staying in contact with. One of them's had a transplant, and they asked me, should I get another vaccine? I've only had the J&J. &J. Should I get another shot? I'm not recommending another shot yet. But I'll tell you what, we're looking at the data real closely to watch it and, and see. And as far as mixing the vaccine, I suspect we're going to end up that you can mix that vaccine. What do you think? I know we, don't, we can't make that recommendation officially, but there's some emerging evidence that suggests that it's probably going to be okay to mix. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the safety is going to be there. You know, we've heard those anecdotes. There was that one woman who actually received six doses all at one time a full vial of vaccine for the mRNA. They watched her in the hospital for a couple of days. She did well. Um, I know other people who have gotten trial doses of AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson when the trials were opened up. Uh, but then when there was the emergency use authorization of the mRNA vaccines, they ended up getting those full dosing. We know it's safe. Uh, so I think the safety is going to be there. I think we are going to be looking at the efficacy and really the need. But again, right now, there's no guidance to to add doses or add vaccines on what you've already had if you are fully vaccinated. So, Haka, like me, if you had one of those transplant patients or somebody who had had the JJ vaccine you're a little concerned about, would you recommend to them now to go get an mRNA vaccine? Because I've not done that yet. Yeah. You know, that's hard. Um, again, no guidance to do that. I think there is more uh, information coming out about those immune suppressed patients needing extra dosing even of the mRNA vaccines. Um, so I'm not going to say that it, it's a bad idea to do that. I certainly believe it would be safe. Um, but, uh, you know, the new data is suggesting that even with the mRNA vaccines, you probably need uh, a three-dose regimen at least to mount a detectable antibody response. So I think that's coming down the pike. Um, again, there's still no other guidance from 
the the transplant physicians or the transplant society that I'm aware of, but I think they are probably moving in that direction. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think, you know, I, I bet they will come in that direction. As you as you cited, there was a New England Journal of Medicine a discussion under yeah. correspondence last week that mentioned the efficacy of a three-shot regimen as a small number of patients versus a two- or one-shot regimen, so we'll see. So, Taylor, here's my answer, direct answer to the question. At this time, I would not recommend a follow-up dose to J&J. However, I watch it every darn morning, and I would continue to do that and say to you, you know, by this time next week, Building the airplane while we fly it, I may change that answer. But right now, I can't give that. I can't say yes to it. Um, although I'm probably trying, I'm probably moving that direction. Other questions out there? Dr. Pittman with Channel Nine has two questions today, and they really are two questions. The first one has right. to do with with the Delta variant on the Missouri side. How concerned are we about what might happen on the Kansas side? Because we know there are neighbors and people cross back and forth. Yeah, Delta virus. I think the Delta variant is throughout the United States. It's not in one state or another state. It's just been more talked about in Missouri because of the Springfield uh, issues. But I, I think, as, as you pointed out, Hawkeye, it's by far the most common uh, uh, type of strain that we've got circulating right now, Kansas or Missouri. And the second question that Donna has is similar. With the Delta variant all around us, how concerned are you for school in the fall, for the children who can't be vaccinated, and for the teachers? What do you think, Hawk? I, I, I think if you're vaccinated, you're safe, and if you're not, wear a mask. Yeah, I think for those adults in the school system, uh, the administrators, the, the certified people, the teachers, all those adults that had the ability to get the vaccine early on and got it, uh, they are going to be protected. If they have not get it, I would strongly recommend that they get it to avoid morbidity, to avoid illness, to avoid missed days of work, all of that. And again, I think we, I still do anticipate that we are going to probably hear um, in the next you know, six or seven or eight weeks that younger children are going to be able to get it. That's complete speculation, but we know how the vaccine data analysis and collection has been ex expedited. I'm fairly certain it's going to be safe. So I think that probably right as school is starting or right before school starts, those younger children are going to be able to be vaccinated. Okay. Okay, we're good. All right. Well, let's turn to the rest of our discussion. I'm going to turn first out here to uh, uh, the Olathe Fire Department Marshal, um, uh, uh, Fire Marshal Wassum, who, um, and ask you a couple of questions. Uh, I think there may be even a cool demonstration we're going to get to in a, in a moment. Uh, first of all, thanks for joining us this morning. Before we get to that demonstration, though, tell us how COVID-19 has impacted the Olathe Fire Department here uh, during the pandemic. Uh, sure thing. And thanks, Doctor. Uh Good morning, everybody from Olathe Fire Station number six. Um, really, uh, COVID affected us uh, like many other organizations. We had to overcome challenges and uh, find new ways to, to do things, new procedures, obviously new protective equipment. Um, but really what uh, we're proud of is it uh, caused us to be innovative. You know, obviously everybody kept having fire and medical emergencies. Um, we couldn't stop providing care. Uh, we're proud of the excellent care we provide. We had to keep doing that. So we came up with new, th new ways and, and uh, new programs that we could do to protect our citizens and visitors. So a few that we're really proud of um, with schools shut down, we partnered our mobile integrated health unit with the school nurses. And uh, we actually worked together to provide care for children that were at home because their schools were shut down or they were there doing remote schooling, often without parents. So uh, really great that we could provide that care. Our integrated health unit also uh, assisted with monitoring patients that had COVID. And uh, we had some uh, smartwatch technology, some smartphone technology where we could monitor those patients, uh, make sure they were recovering properly and maybe flag uh, if they were going the wrong way. Uh, some other things we had to do, obviously with public education, we couldn't uh, get out and be in the schools and be in the public. So we did a lot with our public education programs. Um, really proud now that we've converted most of those to electronic and digital delivery. So we can either give them in person or it works, or we can give them from a, a fire station or fire administration. Gave us a lot of flexibility. And on top of that, uh, with permitting and uh, offering virtual inspections, we really 
continue to take care of folks in fire prevention as well. So a lot of, lot of great achievements. You know, it, it really forced us to be innovative and, and come up with new things. And uh, for all the harm it did in our community, it actually helped us get a little better. So. Well, Chief, thank you very much for that great work. And to you and your team and all of our fire and police out there, thank you very much for the outstanding work, especially during this difficult time of the pandemic. So with the 4th of July almost here, <clears throat> what worries you most about all that? Uh, firecrackers going into houses, although right now it does is rain in Kansas City, so maybe that won't be as much of a problem, but assuming <laughs> it's going to be a little drier. Um, or injuries from people shooting on, uh, off their fireworks. Well, wh wh where's your concern lay? Well, definitely all of the above. And, you know, uh, fireworks are a dangerous thing. I'd say locally uh, we, we do have more of a problem with injuries than we do fires, but we do have fires every year. Uh, just a little bit of data from the National Fire Protection Association. Uh, they report across the U.S. we have an average of about 9,000 injuries each year and about 19,000 uh, fires each year. A lot of those are grass fires, but we do have structure fires. We seem to have a couple every year about this time, and uh, so we really worry about all of it. But, uh, you know, injuries are, are, like I said, the most common thing we see here locally. So Dr. Deval Vavsar, who is the director of our burn unit, is here. We mentioned it earlier today. So talk to us a little bit, Doc, about some of the issues you're seeing up in the burn unit around this time of the year and the impact of fireworks. So it's really the Christmas in July for our burn units across the country and including us. And so we see this every year, the extended weekend um, of the July 4th, we see lots and lots of injuries. Um, most of these injuries involve um, a curious kid um, getting too close to the fireworks they are enjoying, or a young adult, a male mostly, um, getting kind of too uh, mischievous and wanting to be sure that the mortar that he is trying to kind of start uh, goes off. Um, it doesn't, starts to fire, like light it again, and it goes off in uh, his hand or just right next to him. And uh, we see those devastating injuries every single year, be it sparklers or mortars or many other types of um, kind of fireworks. And young male, young female also, but more so male than female, most of those years. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I remember as a kid, I played with fireworks all the time. And I didn't, have my, I didn't have my kids do that. I was always a little scared of them. But uh, I know it's such a darn big thing, and, and, and yet the damage can happen in just that split second, and you're stuck with that damage for the rest of your life. Absolutely, and I, I think you said it so, so much right. So the reason for the damage is, that, um, to do example, sparklers, kind of, uh, they burn at 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't use any um, kind of type of fire around us that goes that high. Hot water is usually 120, 130 um, kind of Fahrenheit setting. Um, or or the, um, the grills that we use, probably at the highest 500, some specialized grills can go up higher. But this 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit of the sparkler, it only needs a fraction of a second someone touching it, and it leads to a burn. Or a mortar that is going to be blast injury on top of the temperature or the high temperature it will have. Those kind of injuries would leave definitely a lifelong effect, if especially that's a mortar where they have a pan blown off. Um, I've seen enough of it to say that, yeah, please avoid, don't be part of that statistics. Yeah, that's just tough. You don't want to be a statistic on this one because it is so permanent. And, mm -hmm. and what do you recommend for safety? People want to try and handle fireworks. Um, for, I, I think this year, so last year was very different, and I think we expected it to be different because of the restrictions um, from the COVID pandemic. Most cities did not do their um, city fireworks. And because of that, most families ended up purchasing their own fireworks and then did it next to home. All, and most families and many more families than usual got involved and we ended up seeing almost double the injuries last year. Our hope is this year there will be less of those restrictions and there will be fewer families doing it and we end up will seeing a fewer um, injuries. But at the same time, the best is to be careful. If you're having your kids enjoy the fireworks, please make sure someone is monitoring, watching over them to be safe. If you are doing it, like using um, bottle rockets, mortars, or other more dangerous fireworks, make sure you are less um, risky. If it doesn't go off after turn, like lighting it first at once, please let it go. Just, just wait it out and use a new one. Don't try to light it again. Don't get close to it. 
because that's how we ended up seeing most of our injuries. You know, Chief, I think that uh, this program is going to get a reputation about being where fun goes to die. We told everybody to wear a mask, stay home, and now we're telling you to be careful with all the fireworks. <laughs> Chief, what do we do out there? How do we let people have fun and yet not die or lose part of your body doing something that's just a little dumb? Yeah, well, uh, you know, we'll show you some of the dangers here in a second uh, with uh, even the most basic sparkler. but. Uh, our top recommendation is just like what the doctor just said. Let's let's leave it to the professionals. Uh, a lot of great shows around the metro area and you know and across the country. Those folks go through a lot of trouble. They've got a lot of safeguards to keep themselves and the audience safe. So we recommend you go watch a professional show. In yeah. many areas around the metro, uh, fireworks are illegal. So um, obviously we all know they still happen, but. Um, you know, they, they are le illegal to use in most cities, including Olathe. Yeah, I call that Royal Stadium. That's where I go to it. So, okay, you got a pretty cool <laughs> demonstration. This is the PG-13, or R, I guess, uh, if you don't like any of us. PG-13, part of our program. We're not usually like that, but let's take a look. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Doctor. So uh, we're going to do a couple of demonstrations today. Uh, like we talked about, just the, the most basic of sparklers. I know you probably can't see that very well, but... Uh, a lot of folks think that these are, are very safe. They let their kids use them, but uh, we're gonna do two demonstrations. The, the first will be with a hot dog here that's meant to simulate uh, the flesh, your skin, or maybe a finger. Um, we're gonna light the sparkler, going to just ever so briefly touch it to the hot dog and you'll see how quickly it burns. Uh, the second demonstration we'll do is we'll uh, hold the sparkler up next to a shirt. Uh, you know, these new synthetic uh, clothes and shirts and pants that a lot of folks are wearing now will will show just how quickly those can be affected by uh, just a basic sparkler. So, uh, unless there are questions, I'll uh, uh, let's I'll do it. The first one I, I want to watch we'll, the hot dog. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's make sure our lighter works here. All right, so just basic sparkler. I'm going to hold it here just in front of the hot dog, and we'll just touch it a second or less. So you can see uh, already just that brief touch, uh, the flesh of the hot dog is very charred. You know, and even the, the piece that's already burned uh, beyond the flame, we touch that, still hot enough to make a burn. The metal stays very hot. Dr. Bob Shaw, so this we'll has got to be... a few times here. Yeah. You got to be cringing as you watch this because you know yes. this is somebody's this coming is exactly. to your emergency room yes. having need help. This is exactly how a lot of kids over this um, uh, time get, get burn injuries. That they just are enjoying that sparkler. Um, they end up touching the hot end or just by mistake, um, kind of dropping on their feet, leg, on their pants. Yeah, this, this definitely. And, and then the, the worst part is because it's so hot, um, it will lead to a very deep burn. It is not like a hot water burn that will be not as deep or a sun burn, which will be not deep at all. This will be absolutely a deep burn. Kids sometimes step on these with their feet. Absolutely. Yeah, I might be speaking they, from yep. experience. <laughs> you can't put this genie back in the box. box. Yep. All right, Chief, what else you got? Yeah, so uh, first thing I'll mention here before I move on, and, and like someone just mentioned, uh, really easy to step on these, and like I said, they stay hot. We recommend you put them in a metal pail uh, full of water. Make sure they uh, get down there and get cooled off. And you have a fire extinguisher so right the there in case I'll you have here. trouble. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Got a fire prevention guy has to have a fire extinguisher. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> well, the uh, second one we'll light here. Uh, this is a different type of sparkler. I think they call it a morning glory. It has a wood stick, so the metal, uh, metal stick doesn't get quite as hot. But uh, you'll see these still burn really hot. And we're going to show what it'll do to a shirt here. Just get this lit. So you're telling me that when I wear my, my cool polyester fishing shirts, I'm really not flame retardant here? No, not flame retardant. And I think you'll see here that uh, melts the fabric very quickly. You yeah. know, it may, not, uh, it may not light and burn, but what it's doing with this synthetic material, it's basically plastic. Yep. So, you know, I think when we're done here, we can zoom in on it. Yep. And uh, you'll see that it melts the plastic and that molten plastic right around where the sparkler touches, that can actually end up on your skin and, and bind Whoa. with your skin. 
Mm. So uh, if that happens, uh, you're making a trip to you're making a trip to the burn center to get that plastic removed and and uh, take care of that burn. So. Well, like oh, I'm not saying this does very, not look like fun. Very quickly. This definitely doesn't. And, yeah. and again, um, over years, since we have seen anywhere from 20 to 40 patients during this four-day weekend, three-day weekend time. Last year was the highest in, in the 10, 11 years that I've uh, covered burn unit uh, at KU. We had 42 patients last year. Ouch. It was just extensive. Man, were you on call last week, That last year for the... I was involved, yes. Yeah, that's, that's tough. That is tough. I hope Absolutely you don't have tough. to take call this weekend. That's going to be a big one. Right. Whoever will be will be busy. Yeah. Okay. All right, Chief. Was there another demonstration after that? Uh, those are the ones we had for today. I, I think maybe there were some videos, some things we've done in the past. You know, the, the rain's not okay. going to be too cooperative with other demonstrations here this morning. but uh, It's all right. Well, I understand yeah, there's uh, an M80. The I understand there's an M80 with a watermelon we're going to watch here. Are you guys ready? This is like black. Oh, that's not good. Yes. So just to say, I, 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 you know, Chief, that, that's got to You get into an injury from an M80, that's like, that's like dynamite here. That's really devastating. Yes. It'll do a lot of damage. And, uh, you know, we've got a few things here just... Uh, for demonstration and display, you know, what, what you're talking about with an M80 is something that looks similar to this. That's what was in the watermelon mm -hmm. uh, in the video that you just saw. So basic stuff, lots of folks have them. Uh, uh, you can buy them around the country. These are illegal in the state of Kansas along with bottle rockets. So, um, you know, they're illegal for a reason. They're, they're dangerous, True. they cause injuries, uh, they cause destruction and fires. So. Um, you know, yes. like I said, we really just uh, hope you'll leave it to the professionals and be careful with the, the materials if you do choose to use them. And just be aware of the regulations uh, wherever you might live. Talk to your local officials about uh, what's legal and what's not legal in your city or your county where you, where you live. So MAT and other types of mortars, we see injuries from them uh, very frequently. Um, and those injuries will usually involve uh, hands and then face or both. Um, the injuries, the worst injury I've seen is entire hand blown off um, in a young child who got access to uh, his father's um, mortar kind of collection. And uh, that, that is an injury that just will never be able to be repaired or fixed. And um, even not losing the hand entirely, but losing a finger or two, or having injury to all the way to the bone and tendons, those, those are definitely lifelong effects that people will live with. Even though it will happen one in thousand, one in ten thousand, it still is enough numbers that we end up seeing that we, every year, uh, we come out and talk about it to make sure people kind of see that as a serious uh, possibilities and, and, and possibility for serious injury uh, and make sure hopefully we can, can reduce injuries in our own community. I'd be happy to see fewer patients over the July 4th weekend. You know, it's funny how we make excuses for this kind of things, but if I said to you, okay, you're inside, and now a thousand of you are going to step outside, and one of you is going to die from lightning. It's going to happen to one of you. I don't know who it is, but one of you is going to die. How many people are going to step outside, right? Not many. <laughs> but we go out and we do this stuff with the fireworks all the time, and yet you see, as you say, you see all these injuries that come in. It can be pretty darn dangerous. Well, Chief, thank you. Doctor, thank you. thank you. We're going to come back. We'll involve these guys in our conversation because, Jill, I bet there's some questions out there. There are a couple. A lot of the questions this morning were over the J&J &J vaccine, but I think you covered that pretty thoroughly. LJ wants to know, however, how do you know if the COVID symptoms are allergy symptoms or the new variant? Yeah, you know, the only way you know is to get tested, Hawkeye, because COVID can present like an allergy and they're an allergy attack. So there's really no way to know other, other than getting tested. And just to make a comment, I think as masks have come off, at least in my patient population, we're getting routine sick calls we haven't had for over a year, and they're getting tested and they're negative. So people with the cold and flu, the junk of stuff that we always get is out there, that summer cold, that's out there, and people are getting it. The problem is you don't know if you have COVID or not, you've got to still get tested because if you're positive, how we respond to that is much different because common cold doesn't die, it causes death. COVID on 19 and the Delta variant, on the other hand, as we've demonstrated here and in, 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 in Springfield and across the globe, Delta variant is dangerous. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, again, the symptomatology really hasn't changed from the original circulating uh, isolate uh, back in 2020 till now. The symptoms really remain the same. It is difficult to tell. We know there are other common cough and cold viruses that are circulating. So the best way to be sure is just go get tested. Um, and on top of that, you know, get vaccinated if you haven't been vaccinated already. Because we know that vaccination will also help reduce that whole spectrum of disease of coronavirus as well. Yeah, it is so true. Okay. Susan has a question for the. You can see it, but. Susan has a question for the fire marshal. She wanted to know if uh, we were so busy last year, were you really busy last year during the 4th? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it was talked about earlier uh, with no professional shows and, and people looking for something to do, uh, lots more fireworks uh, that we experienced as well. And uh, we always have a lot of, lot of runs, a lot of calls this time of year, but uh, Definitely more when folks are stuck at home and, and don't have another option to go see. But uh, this year, hopefully it's different. Uh, lots of shows going on and hopefully folks will get out and watch those and uh, not do so much at home. So Dr. Bob Sarr, do you, uh, do you pray for rain on the 4th of July? <laughs> um, yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I didn't want to be the party pooper, but like not in that sense, but uh, again, I would rather have people enjoy it be able to enjoy the kind of professional fireworks that CT um, sets up. I think I would like to do the same, but at the same time, I think if that's how we're gonna reduce the injuries, I think rain would be okay. So really, you've mentioned this is Christmas in July for you, but really what you ought to be saying is let it rain, let, let it, it rain, rain, let it rain. Okay, yeah. next question. All right, we're singing, yay. Joe says, oh, just made one. <laughs> yeah. Joe says that she has a friend who is 25 years old, got the Pfizer shot later in the day, developed chest pain, ended up going to the hospital and her friend had pleurisy. Is that a side effect of the, of the shot? Yeah, that's pretty fast to be from the this, this shot, to be honest with you, Hawkeye. I mean, normally it takes a while to get the immune response, and and uh, certainly you, you, we're not going to discount anything. But um, And people from the shingle shot get all sorts of symptoms and other shots as well, so I don't know it's unique. But that, that, that would be rapid, just to say. That would be right. We'd, we'd know, need a lot, know a lot more about the facts of the case before we could fully comment, I think. Yeah. Gene says that he went to the Auschwitz exhibit and nobody was masked. He still wore his, and he's wondering on indoors, would you advise that people still wear their masks? What do you think, Hawkeye, to mask or not to mask indoors? CDC or WHO, yeah. what do you think? I think uh, people are very thoughtful in asking these questions. And just, again, understand your individual risk and what you are willing to tolerate. Um, so, if, first of all, get vaccinated. Second of all, if you can do things outdoors, do it. If you are doing things indoors and, and going to some of these um, events, then understand what you are willing to tolerate. So continue to distance, mask if it makes you feel more comfortable. Um, do those things that we've talked about because, uh, you know, at this point in time, you have to assume that probably 100, not 100% of those people in those events are vaccinated so i think if you go into that understanding that and then you just understand what your tolerance of risk is so um just, and, and just to take on that i think that's a great point we've talked a lot about what is your personal risk assessment throughout this and just because the cdc says you don't have to mask doesn't mean yep. you you don't have to mask you can still fully mask also remember if you're not been vaccinated you're supposed to mask right that's the whole point of that, that it doesn't say nobody needs to mask anymore it says if you've not been vaccinated, you should mask. If you have been, you don't have to. And um, what I'm seeing for the most part is that nobody masks anywhere inside buildings and stores anymore. And yet our vaccination rate's not 100%. I'm just saying there's a problem here with the math. And your answer is probably works for Gayla too, because she's concerned about going to the Royals game. She, with the Delta variant, and she wanted to know, should I mask if I go to the Royals game? And yeah. recently I went and I wore it when I was like around crowded people. And then yeah. I took it off. When uh, I you probably down. made a good choice. That's the choice I would make. But just to remind ourselves that the Royals games are outside. And we know that outside yeah. transmission is a lot less common. Although the Delta variant may be, we don't know enough data, I don't think yet, Hawk, about the Delta variant being outside. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it's still, as we've always said, it would feel more comfortable outdoors. You know, we know there's turbulent uh, airflow at that point, so any virus or particles is going to be dispersed into very low concentrations. Um, you know, if you can still distance uh, six feet or more, that's important. Um, as these events open up for full seating, whether it's uh, Arrowhead or the K or Sporting, um, you know, you're going to be around more people, but it is much less risk. And again, if you feel more comfortable, then, then certainly mask. Dr. Bob, sorry, do you still mask in the operating room? <laughs> uh, I will not be allowed to operate without that. Yes, because it keeps who safe? Correct. It keeps the patient, patient safe. Patient safe. Yeah, you've yes. got to remember, masks are not a new thing. <laughs> yep. And Andy gets our last question today because I think we're running out of time. And uh, essentially, she wants to know she's going to be around family in a month. She gets her first shot of her vaccine and is, I think, asking, should she cheat and get the second one at two weeks because she's worried about having more time to build immunity or just do the way it's directed at three weeks, one week before she sees this big group of family? Well, first, thanks for getting your shot. That's the right thing to do. Hawk, I think we got to stick to the program because really thinking you're going to get that second shot early may not help you as much as you needed to. Yeah, exactly. We know that those first doses of the mRNA vaccines do offer protection, although not as great as fully vaccinated, which is two weeks after the second dose. But I would in no circumstances uh, push up that schedule. If anything, uh, there, you know, you may be better off even uh, uh, lengthening that schedule from either that three or four week second dose, depending on what company you are getting your mRNA vaccine from. But I think the best recommendation is to stick to the scheduled dosing regimen. Yep. All right. So, hey, tomorrow we hear from our chief medical officers. They've been checking in with us throughout this pandemic. And tomorrow, Dr. Larry Boss from Advent Health, Dr. Ragu Adega from Liberty Health, and Dr. Mark Steele with Truman Medical Center's University Health will be joining us in the program. It's always a pleasure to have those guys on here, kind of figure out what's going on around the city. We think there's been a little bit of an uptick, but l let's see what's going on with their hospitals as well. And we'll all come together and talk about, I'm sure, all things Delta variant as well as vaccination, J&J, &J, mRNA, et cetera. We're going to find out how they're also sitting going into the holiday weekend. Let's go around the horn today with final thoughts. Um, Chief, I'm going to turn to you first. Thanks again for being on the program. Thanks to you and your team for all the great work that you do and the way you save lives every day. Final thoughts for today. Uh, sure. And thanks a lot for having us. Um, really, we'll just reiterate, uh, be safe. Go watch a uh, Go watch a professional show. If you have to use fireworks, uh, we urge you to follow the instructions. Don't throw or hold the, the materials. Don't make your own. Those are incredibly dangerous. Don't use homemade fireworks and dispose of them properly. So just be safe, everybody. All right, so Mr. Christmas in July, the weather outside is frightful. The fireworks, that makes them quiet full. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that was terrible. Final thoughts for today. Um, no, and I, again, um, happy Independence Day. I know that we all will enjoy it. Be safe. Be safe around fireworks. Be safe around grills. Don't mix kind of you know, alcohol and, and any type of fires. Yeah, my, my daughter could tell a story. One time I was at a campfire with her, and I wanted to see how much isopropyl alcohol would burn. And you know what it burns. What do you know about that? Oh, definitely there are. There are some really <laughs> – I, 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 yeah, my, my daughter would kind of make me uh, kind of not say this, but there are, there are cool YouTube videos where young kids have tried to see what it does to their skin when they would drop, like put a no. alcohol on their skin and burn. And for sure it burns. Yeah, not good, yeah, right? There was some – challenge going on at some point and i think uh, the kids have yeah, had some burns we have treated some here years back so yeah please don't mix any type of alcohol in that case and fire it yeah. does burn and just to say, we said a big thank you to the fire marshal. We need to thank, thank a big you. thank you to the, the Burnett Burn Center. These guys and, yeah. and, and Dr. Bosar is our, one of our leaders there. I, I grew up here as a pulmonary doc and worked for years over in the burn unit and, and taking care of patients. And I, I just think that's one of the hardest things to do. Um, and, and, you know, when you get a significant burn, man, that is everybody all hands on deck. These guys do an amazing job. So thank you. Thank thank you. you. And, thank and you. thanks for your advice for both of you this morning. Hawkeye, final thoughts? Yeah, be safe. Hopefully everybody can be with their loved ones. And as we heard yesterday on the show, um, some of our elderly loved ones who may have been more isolated this past year. I think Dr. Bobsar, 
uh, gave some of the best advice I've heard on this whole year and a half is don't mix fireworks and alcohol. That is uh, very sage <laughs> advice for sure. Dr. Bob Sar is an excellent, thoughtful burn surgeon. We've worked several times. You know, infection risk is major uh, when you have a disruption of the skin, one of the, the, the body's largest organs. So we work together a lot, but he always uh, does, his, does his best and, and patients usually come out on, on the right end with that. But protect yourself so you don't get in that position. And again, continue to go out and get vaccinated. As we show, showed here early on in the show, the Delta variant uh, has become probably the largest proportion of the prevalent uh, uh, variants circulating in Kansas and Missouri now. Uh, Springfield is going through some hard times. We don't wanna go through that in our Kansas City community, so continue to encourage vaccination to all of those who've not been vaccinated yet. So a special heads off and thank you again to um, uh, Dr. Deval Bobsar, our, our director of our uh, medical director of the burn unit and fire marshal assistant chief of community risk reduction, Mark Wassum. You guys, thanks for being on the program. Hawkeye, of course, we can't wait for you to get back here in the studio so I can mess with you some more. And uh, to all of our listeners out there, you know, I know it feels like you get tired of hearing from us and now we're talking about the Delta variant and things could still go on. You know what, just like what we're telling you on the 4th of July, Make good choices a good jo because, because making good choices brings tomorrow to you in a way that you can enjoy it as opposed to suffering. So don't make the bad choice. You know what the good choices are. We've told you for a long time ago, BKC. So take care of yourself. Take care of the people you love, whether it's on the 4th of July and you're dealing with fireworks or wearing a mask in order to stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>